Valley. Thanks so much for being a part of our services today at Arden Valley Church. Can you believe it's not only the Easter season, but we're focusing on that death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope you've been following along as we've been journeying to the cross. So grab your Bible, grab some take notes with, or if you just want to stay completely digital, you can see these notes there in the app section or the notes section of our app, hardenvalleychurch.com slash app. Make sure you're praying. Make sure you're inviting. Make sure that you, if at all possible medically, that you're here with us as we look forward to celebrating Resurrection Sunday. Today, we're going to look at that intimate Last Supper where Jesus changes everything. And He wants to change everything in your life. So thanks so much for joining us for our service. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil and victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood.
it's our prayer that he is your savior and if he's not please see one of us after the service you can be seated amen Well, that's great music this morning. So thankful. And uh, how many of you enjoyed the music? Say amen. Amen. Well, it's good. Such good stuff. And good to see you and have all of you here. If it is this going to be needed at the end, may I move it? No, you're good. You're good. You'll take that. All right. You'll take that. You'll take this. You'll take that. All right. I got a coaster. Anybody need a coaster? All right. So that's my fault. It is, boy, hard to believe that we are just this close to celebration time of the Easter season and so close, so close to so many things and glad to see each of you. And again, as Riley said a moment ago, if this is uh, your first time, first time in a while, we look forward to smiling at you, saying hello. If we hadn't already, we got a special gift for you in the lobby and we love to I would love to hand you a special gift. How many of you, again, I've asked this, how many of you like special gifts? How many of you like average gifts? How many of you like anything but a tax bill? All right, that's just, uh, yeah, it is that season as, uh, <laughs> as well. And so we're delighted. And we've been singing, uh, I, I start to say Easter songs. They're not really Easter songs. They're the songs of the church, right? You know, suffered, bled, and died. That sounds about right. In fact, we're looking at that this morning, all throughout the Old Testament, pointing to, pointing to the Lamb that would come, the Lamb that would take away the, the sin of the world. And so I, I hope, and again, maybe if you're unfamiliar with this kind of terminology, that they not only pique your interest, but you go, what, what is the deal? What's all this symbolism? You know, because you sing some songs, you think, man, we're, it's, like, it's you know, like we're singing the songs of the butchers, you know, and singing about cows and cattle and lamb and sheep and and agriculture and you know I don't live there I live you know in a digital world and so I hope I hope you'll not only learn to appreciate that but see the point behind all of it I think I think there's such a huge thing that is there and so we're glad with a new month a new occasion uh, for us is a new time to learn some uh, some new scripture and so we enjoy we enjoy getting to do that we're going to work on some new verses you came in are, uh, are just fantastic greeters. I mean, we've gotten, well, God has just blessed us with so many just wonderful folks, and they're the first face you see as you, came, as you came in, and they had paper for you, and paper you didn't have to pay for, paper you can scribble on uh, if you get bored during the sermon, uh, paper to help you remember what the preacher said. And so in there is a, should be a little card and, uh, and a verse card, and we also present this as a download. You can get it for your phone your tablet, and uh, in your computer monitor, but we, uh, we want to encourage you to do that and try and work on these. And we say if you'll, if you'll uh, look at these verses, you know, every time you eat, if you're a teenager, you'll have it memorized by tomorrow, uh, but the rest of us maybe in a few days, and let them sink into your heart. It's one thing to have a Bible. Anybody ever seen a Bible in the back of somebody's car? Anybody old enough to remember when the backs of cars, you know, had that ledge where the speakers were? And you kept things that, you know, back there for kind of emergency. I remember growing up, you could have an umbrella, a family Bible, <coughs> and a box of crackers, you know, and still have plenty of room in the back windshield. And, uh, and, so, and so don't let your Bible be there. Let, get God's Word, get into God's Word, and let God's Word get into you. One of the best ways to do that is through Scripture memorization. So we ask you to help us out here. And so we'll review this this morning. I know it sounds a little like school, but this is the tradition of the church. The church read the Word, they said the Word, they learned the Word, in the best days of the church when they lived the Word. How many of you think all four of those would be a good idea in 2022? Stand with us if you would. We're in Matthew 28, <coughs> familiar maybe to a few of you, and we'll just say it together. <coughs> Excuse me. Say it together this morning. Start with verse 5. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. If it's a period, excuse me, if the verse is in there, that's just sad. By the way, that's exactly normal other than the fact that there's angels here. Or angel mentioned here and women, excuse me, I got my pluralities mixed up. But he doesn't, verse 6. 
He is not here, for He is risen. As He said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. The tomb had been, excuse me, the stone had been rolled back. Miraculously, they would go in the ledge that had been cut into the stone outcropping there, and they would be able to see what should have been a body, loosely wrapped, a body they would want to put some, some spices on. The Jews did not embalm. And they found, instead of a body, instead of a decaying, beginning to decay corpse, they found an empty tomb. He is risen, verse 7. And go quickly, tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there ye shall see him. Lo, I have told you. I've told you, you can be seated. <clears throat> and whether this is a great comfort to you or a bit of a mystery, whether this whole idea promotes skepticism or it's a great source of comfort, I, I want to invite you, look as hard as you want, as hard as you want at the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. Push it as much as you can and be convinced and content that we're not hoping in hope. Nod your head if you understand the difference there. We're believing not in belief, but there's truth that's there. There's truth. And, uh, and one of the things we're doing this month, and you can grab a copy, it's is part of our giveaways this month, is a, is a book that kind of examines that. And so from a scriptural and a, and a scientific, academic perspective, it would be a real comfort to you. And I want to encourage you, Christianity can withstand your scrutiny. It can withstand. <clears throat> Why? Because the truth, the truth can always stand up to scrutiny. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. And, and, and again, those that maybe you got questions, you know someone like that, <clears throat> please don't hesitate to invite them. Invite them here as we continue to look at this, as we uh, continue to make our journey, our journey to journey to the cross. Let me just say a couple of thank yous here and we'll dismiss the kids. Let me say thank you again. Those who've been working around here, particularly in the last several weeks, don't the grounds and everything just look so good, flower beds and all that kind of stuff. And a couple of guys got some of the last landscape edging done and just, uh, just really, really pretty. And that's what you ought to do, man. We ought to take care of the Lord's stuff. Nod your head if you believe that. And we ought to get ready for company, right? Get ready for coming. You ever had somebody show up, you didn't know they were coming, and you start trying to kick everything in the closet, except the stuff in the closet was there the last time you had company come over? And, and you're there, and you're like, uh, hey, hey, and, and you're really happy to see them, but you're really mad that they came without calling? <laughs> and uh, those, uh, those kind of things, I, everybody in here is a better housekeeper than I am, uh, than we are, Andrea. But anyhow, and so, so we're in here. We want to get ready for company, because Lord willing, in the next several weeks, I mean, we're asking God to just fill this place up on Easter Saturday and fill this place up on Easter Sunday. How many of you think that's a good idea? And if everybody will bring one, we'll be right there. If you'll bring two, you can have your own row. If you'll bring three, you can preach. And, uh, and we want you to do that. We've got some invite cards out there. If you haven't grabbed your pack of ten, get them, use them, staple a dollar bill to them. Staple a five dollar bill to him. If you'll staple a ten dollar bill to him, I'll come as your guest, and, uh, and 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 invite people. Go up and down your road, pray, invite, meet your neighbors, invite your neighbors, and and ask the Lord to do that. Meet your coworkers, invite them. Please, uh, please do do that. And then we'll say it at the end of the service as well. <clears throat> but I want to encourage you, particularly, we need about ten more volunteers for Easter Saturday. It's a it's a up and down kind of thing with us, but if we have a, if we have four or five hundred people here <coughs> come through, uh, we'll need to give some folks the ability to go sit down for a second, even though we're going to run just an hour or so. So we need we need some extra workers. That's eleven thirty to about two thirty. We're only going to be running at about one to two. Doesn't really take that long to do. But if you hadn't signed up, hadn't let us know, and then look right here for a second. If God lets us have 80, 90, 100, 110 folks here on Easter Sunday, we'll need extra folks in the nursery. Nod your head if you understand that. Then we invite somebody to come in and then, then say, hey, we're glad you're here, but you need to stay with your own kid in the nursery. That's kind of an odd thing. 
we don't want to do that and we'll need some extra folks with the young people because we'll have a little bit of an Easter egg hunt for them after they hear the gospel and so so make sure if you haven't indicated I'm willing to serve however Easter Saturday Easter Sunday uh, please uh, please let us know that and then a lot of you brought in some candy this morning thank you we were looking about 15 more bags or give or take we need about 4,000 pieces of candy if we do a normal day so thank you thank you so much <coughs> for doing that and we uh, we appreciate that uh, so so very kindly and thank you again and uh, and so we got just uh, I think we got two videos back there guys is that right just one we got a greeting video don't we right in front of it <clears throat> we have a great video somewhere and uh, look right at me anytime this happens understand who messed it up it's never those guys back there it's me but anyway we've got it we did find it all right we've got it Easter invite okay Whew. Somewhere I put that Easter video. Thank you. So we're going to watch that, and we're going to hear, we're going to hear from, uh, we're going to hear from our uh, our missionary. And while you do that, again, if you've not had a chance to give, this is a great opportunity. A lot of you like doing that while you're catching up on, on the Easter video. Okay, we're going to let the young folks be dismissed. Is that okay with you? And uh, or do you want to watch the video? All right. Good morning, Heart and Valley Church. I hope you guys are well. Um, it's good to see you guys. Um, as you guys are heading into spring and enjoying the spring weather, uh, we're heading into fall and so I have a bit of sinus stuff going on here, but um, yeah, just excited to connect with you guys. Um, I have been well, uh, ministry has been fun. Um, I think one of the coolest things in the last couple months has been to see just our staff team like with their renewed sense of vision and excitement for the campus. Um, I think you guys probably know we have four new South African interns and we have four American interns right now. and and we'll get another American intern, I think in a few weeks, and then another one in a few more weeks. So by June, July, we'll have like 10 interns. And so it's just fun to have like fresh people on the campus, um, older people on the campus, and, and just getting to do campus ministry again. Um, so many of our staff have just been like, yes, this is why I signed up. Like, this is what I wanna do. Like, I wanna meet students. And so, yeah, some of the highlights are Friday night events. We're probably averaging 50 to 60 at each of our um, campuses, so three different campuses, and then averaging 50 to 60 students at these events. And so they're very heavy relational right now. We're sharing the gospel, but very heavy, like just relationship building. And so it's just been fun to meet new students. Um, and the second kind of encouraging thing is just that the students are coming to our churches. And so each of our partner churches, we're probably averaging 20 to 30 students. And so, yeah, it's just exciting like that, that the, the reason we're not bringing more students to places is because, you know, transport is a different whole other issue here, but it's not because there aren't students, like the harvest is plentiful. And so it's just been cool to see like the way the Lord has provided and um, just fun to see like our staff have been faithful and faithful and faithful and it was COVID and this and that and now like, now it's the harvest and it's plentiful and, and we're just excited to see what the Lord would do. Um, I'm doing well. Our, our resource team is doing well. We're preparing to host a couple of short-term teams in the next few months. And so, yeah, planning a few conferences, planning for the teams to come from America. They'll be here for about six weeks. Um, but yeah, overall, just excited to continue to do my job. The Lord is providing for us financially, so we're excited. Um, yeah, just to, to walk into what he has prepared and for the new normal, which of course still looks different than the old normal, but just excited for what the Lord has for us. So um, thankful for you guys. Thankful for the way you partnership partner with me in gospel ministry and, and just miss you guys, but excited for what the Lord is, is doing. Amen. How's that? Uh, <clears throat> you ever, you ever wonder, you ever wonder if your investment makes any difference? It's one of the things I love about hearing from our folks every week. I mean, that, that's what you're doing. You're having a part in that. You're helping her stay there. And that, by the way, she's leading people to Christ and then training workers. And then as they have these interns in, she's setting them on fire with a Holy Spirit enthusiasm wherever they land. And again, in a hard place, in a difficult place, and trying to do all this, like I said, coming out of quarantine and COVID and all this. And we're, we're just amazed. We appreciate her <coughs> there in the Johannesburg, uh, South Africa area and so so very very thankful <clears throat> thankful for that staying with us if you would this morning and again that's part of your investment as you give to the lord as you drop things off in the box back there as you give electric whatever you're doing as you get to pray you get to do that matthew 26 this morning read several verses here and uh, maybe you can look on the paper if you've got a bible open that up 
<clears throat> someone around you doesn't have a copy of the scripture, you can share with them. Verse 19, and I'll just read it to us. The disciples did. Jesus had appointed them. They made ready the Passover. Underline, highlight that. That's a word we don't do much with because we're not, by and large, many of you didn't grow up Jewish. And so Passover, a cedar meal, a paschal meal doesn't resonate with us. Verse 20, now when the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily, truly I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Not dinner conversation, right? One of you's a bad egg. One of you's going to rat us out. One of you's going to plot my murder. Tough stuff. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dips his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Part of the multi-stage Passover meal that they would, that cedar meal that they would go, would have everything from, <clears throat> from a roasted lamb, which that was to be eaten last, that was the culmination of the meal. But they would have a, a type of gravy, it's not exactly right, but they would take that unleavened, that hard kind of bread, and, and they would dip it in the herbs, they would dip it in there. And so as they're passing around kind of this communal dish or this serving platter, so the guy who's got his hand in the dish with me at the same time, that's who it is. By the way, if you're in a small enough setting, 12, 14 people, everybody knows who just did that. <clears throat> and he answered and said, The Son of Man goes, verse 24, as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he would not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? Has there ever been a more phony baloney? question. That's just guilt. He didn't want anybody to know what was going on. He said to him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, break it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. We see in another place that supper has ended. They finished the normal meal, meal but Jesus is doing something new. Let me help you. You glad Jesus has done something new in your life? He's starting something new. He gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. They finished the roasted lamb. They have finished the culmination of the remembrance of what God did for them in Egypt. And he says, do this. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. The successive stages here. What is he talking about? For this is the blood of the new covenant or new testament which is shed for many for their mission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. I, I want to help us this morning. What does the Lord's table have to do with Easter? Or if you'll allow me to be a little, little, a, a little on point there, I want us to look back and then look to the future. Look back to the future. Can you do that with me this morning? Our heads are bowed just for a moment. <clears throat> Would you pray with me? Our oh, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And let's pray together. Father, these moments are precious because it's your word we're discussing. <clears throat> it's your name we're uplifting. And Lord, it's the time these people have given. So we would not only not waste the time, Lord, we would do something that matters eternally. So may I preach your word with power and authority. May I not just explain it <coughs> casually, but may I explain it well. And may you get honor and glory. But more than that, would you, the great preacher, preach on the inside while I'm preaching on the outside. And God, you would clarify and open, and we would appreciate more than that, we would worship. And Father, if there are those here today, maybe <coughs> for whatever reason have never confessed you as Lord and Savior, never repented of your sins. And, and Lord, this is all just, just interesting liturgy to them. I pray that today before they leave that they would understand what it means to eat and to drink. That the, that the abstract would become personal. And that you would change their story. I pray all this in your son's wonderful name. And amen. You can be seated. <coughs> you can be seated. Be seated. You guys, you guys switch me over to the preacher setting. If you got that good, okay. It's hard for me to think. It's hard for me to think of a long, flat, uh, deep chest freezer 
without fond memories. Before I go any further, because I'm talking to different age groups, if I say a long, rectangular, you know, waist-high, deep chest freezer, does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about the small ones like we've got in our house. I'm not talking about a refrigerator that uh, was an ugly color that somebody put in, in the barn or somebody put uh, in, the, uh, in the garage. I'm talking about just an honest-to-goodness, treasures-to-behold, deep chest freezer. Nod your head. A few of you, half of you, three-fourths of you. Some of you are like, if you're going to talk about food, I'm already hungry. You're going to make me mad. I'll move off it pretty quickly. I hardly ever see one that I don't have the same exact memory. Didn't grow up with one, but my dad's mother, my grandmother, Grandmother Laney, Grandmother Holloman, had one. Had one in the area where we ate food. If you came to Grandma's house, and she was a grandma, I had a nana and a grandmother. <clears throat> Nan and a grandmother. Every time they got together, I always thought it was the weirdest thing. And because uh, they were just very, very different people. Uh, my, my mom's mom, world traveler. My uh, dad's mom, their family migrated from Kentucky, settled, moved in, been there generation after generation on the uh, family, family land. But if you go there, <clears throat> and my grandmother grew up cooking for the four boys and the farm and all those kind of things. So she didn't know how to make a small meal. Nod your head if you're with me. And when she'd cook, even if it was just my, my brother and my grandkids, man, it was just an onslaught of food. And then she'd cover it in plastic wrap, put it in the fridge, and, and eat it later on down the road. And where you didn't throw it away, you just kept on, kept on going. My grandmother also introduced me to the circle of life. I say, what do you mean? She caught a chicken, she killed the chicken, she hung the chicken upside down on the clothesline. I had never seen that before. Didn't deter me from eating chicken. Just made me a little more appreciative. And uh, anyway, and so, but she used that deep chest there, not for what was inside of it. I never knew what was in it. But that's where the desserts were. That's where the desserts were. Whatever was coming after dinner. So whether that was a, <coughs> whether that was a, a coconut cake or some kind of pie or some kind of a black walnut cake, Whatever it was, it was there. And the more people that were coming, the more desserts they were, that was there. Again, didn't appreciate how hard it was to crank all that stuff out. It just magically appeared, I thought. And to come to Grandma Holloman's house and to look and to see stuff on that chest, on that, on that, uh, that freezer there, man, something good's about to happen. Man, I got to get through whatever's I've got to eat because something cools over there. And she was an equal opportunity employer. If you had room on your plate, you could get dessert, even if you thought it was going to be wasted because she was grandma. And, and it was going to be good. I have that, man, that, that wonderful memory. And if I come to your house and see one of those, and there's not one of those cake holder topper things on it, I'm going to be offended and a little discouraged and all. How many of you, there's a place, there's a table, there's a smell, maybe a season, maybe it's Thanksgiving or Christmas where... You identify something really special with a meal or a place or a moment. Maybe it was your, what you ate at your, at your wedding meal. Maybe it was a special thing when you turned 20. I, I don't know, but nod your head if you have something sentimental and special with something where you eat. Nod your head. Just a few of you. A few of you. How many of you like... All I want now is black walnut cake, preacher. And, uh, and so we're here. We're jumping into something that for many of us has almost no significance. And I don't say that because we're ignorant. I just say that because we're not Jewish. We don't spend Friday nights observing the Shabbat. We don't, we don't every so often do this huge cedar meal. We don't take a week to do things. That we, don't, we just don't do that. We don't associate bitter herbs with trying to keep children awake <laughs> so they can understand things. Those, uh, those of you in here, if you saw someone buy some wine and then denature it with about 70% water just so it had a little color to represent the blood that was applied to the door, you just say, man, why don't you just put some food coloring in there? Why in the world are you, why in the world are you going through that other step there if you're just trying to get a color out of it? What, what's going on? When we read this here, we're going, they ate once, they ate twice, and Jesus said some really profound things. And if we're not real careful, we're going, well, that's just strange. Could you be honest with me for a second and go, this is a little different, right? 
We don't typically, unless you're big as I am, eat once then eat again. And we sure don't try and say something special. We don't look at you and go, now this Twinkie represents, right? It represents heart disease. What is, you know, we don't typically do that, do we? We instead, we just like, man, it was a good meal. We pat our bellies. We help clear the table, whatever it is. But there's not object lessons there. There's not stuff here. So when we're jumping into this, we've got to get up the speed a little bit. Is everybody with me here? So let me walk you through it just, just very quickly here. And I've got some things that are <coughs> maybe that'll be a help to you just for a second here. So we're talking about this meal, talking about this meal here. So we've got these two meals, these two dinners here, two dinners. In the New Testament, they're basically three times that a spotlight's put on mealtime or food or something like that. The one is this Passover meal. They'll continue to celebrate the Passover. You'll hear, you read Acts, you'll see in the... See, in the travels of Paul and the other apostles and the missionaries there, they'll focus time. It's about time for Passover. It's about time for this. It's about time for that. And these are seasons and festivals of the year. So you've got that one meal. You've got now the Lord's table. Lord's table. <clears throat> we occasionally call it communion. We occasionally call it uh, uh, the, uh, the Lord's Supper. Again, we're really usually talking about the same thing. But you'll see this mention. And then this kind of gives birth to another, and it's called the love feast or the agape, A-G-A-P-E, the agape meal. And you'll see that. You see it in Corinthians because they're messing around with it. They've corrupted it. They've turned it into fighting. They've turned it instead of a time to get together and focus on fellowship, they've turned it into food. Let me, let me help you here. If we can mess something up as Christians, we'll mess it up, right? Man, if we can figure out a way to just completely miss the point... We'll carry around big Bibles, and we won't read them. Nod your head if you're still with me. We'll come to church and look at the clock, man. How long till we get out of here instead of, man, God speak to me. If we can figure out a way to mess something up, we'll mess it up. Nod your head if you feel that way. And we'll, we'll do that. So you've got these three meals three times here. We'll focus on the one. And so in this one, for 14 centuries, 1,400 years, they've been doing this. <clears throat> they'd pour the four cups, or they'd, they'd have the, the four cups representative. They'd be thankful, first cup. And again, they weren't trying to be boozy. They were trying to give the color of the blood that was applied to the doorpost. They were trying to indicate that this was a time of remembrance and celebration. So again, whatever they'd pour, they would just fill the rest of it up with water. There was no... There's no intent to become inebriated. It was simply a way to do this. And so they would pour this. And whoever was the, the leader, usually the father, the master of the feast, and he would thank God and pray. And, and then they would move through and they, they would have a little bread. And again, the, they would give the kids the, these bitter herbs and try and keep them awake and alert. And they would remind them, God did this. And God did this. And God brought us out. And God showed His wrath on Pharaoh who was not obedient to what God's man had told him to do. And they would teach him. And cup, food, lesson, cup, food, lesson, cup. Finally, the lamb. They said, several scholars have said, archaeologists have tried to corroborate <coughs> Josephus and... Um, and, uh, and uh, 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 Plyas have both said that at the height of the Roman occupation, there were so many Jews that came to Jerusalem that as they would do the slaughtering of the animals, that on that far side of the temple, that the, that the, that the carcasses and the, and, the, and the bloodshed would actually discolor the bank that ran down into the dry Kidron bed, uh, brook bed, and it would discolor and give off a pinkish red hue. It literally would become a river that was stained with blood because of the hundreds of thousands of animals that would be slaughtered just to keep up with demand for the Passover season. We're talking about lots of people, lots of animals, lots of barbecuing, if you allow that. That's what they're doing. They were roasting these lambs. And this was the culmination of the meal. And they'd have this roasted lamb, and when they were done, that was it. <clears throat> no more food. This was, the, this was the celebration. This was the height. 
God provided a way for us to do, and we are looking forward to the, to the advent of the Lamb of God. And so for 1,400 years, millions of animals, millions of Jewish people stopping, pausing, changing things. No leaven. Leaven represented sin. No, no, none of these other kind of things. And they would do this, and they were passing this down. You remember what God did. You remember what God did. You remember what God did. And we look forward to the time when God provides himself a lamb, the Messiah. Over and over. It is a story of food. But on the top of that, it is a story. And I want to offer them to you today. I want to walk you through the change here. I want to give it to you if I can. And when we end, I think maybe in a fresh way, when you get the little juice and little packet of bread in a second, it'll help you. Let me, let me, let me, let me offer the question. How many of you would really like to, again, appreciate the death and the suffering and the resurrection of Christ? How many of you are like me? You need a little help in remembering and appreciating. Maybe we can do that this morning. It's an old story. It's an old story. Pharaoh said no. God said yes. Pharaoh said no. God said yes. Plague, 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 plague. You get up to 10. He says to the Jews, you take the animal, take, find the most spotless one you can without blemish. You're going to sacrifice it. You're going to butcher it rather. While you eat it, you get ready and you take some of the blood from the animal. You put it over the door, the lintel of the, the, the post there. And when the death angel comes, when he sees the blood, he will pass over you. Say, where's Passover from? The death angel would pass over obedience to God's command. And what happened? Man, it was just unbelievable. The judgment, the wrath that came. And Pharaoh said, get out. And in his anger and grief, he changed his mind almost immediately. And the three and a half to five million Jews, as they departed, as they went out, Pharaoh said, go after him, get him, slaughter him, bring him back, whatever you do. But they will hold account for what they've done. God calls the Israelites to encamp there at the Red Sea. No way to go across. If they could find a way, they'd still be caught. And God says, you take and camp. God sends an east, uh, a wind through the, through the valley and the mountains. It blows all night. God pushes the water back. They wake up the next morning. He is concreted, as it were, the ground. Three and a half, five, four, five million people go across. They get across. Here comes Pharaoh and his army, the most military might the world's ever seen. They get there, God withholds the wind, the water comes, and without firing a shot, pulling a sword, He takes care of their enemies. You remember what I did for you. How I took care of you. You remember. Once a year, Passover season, the feast. You remember this. It's an old story. 1,400 years they've been telling it. If you've got your Bibles open, I may give you the verse. Mark chapter 14, verse 12. It's the first day, the day they call unleavened bread. When they killed the Passover, his disciples said, where will we go and prepare? And God has got all of this worked out. The Passover lambs are being killed. And that evening, the Passover meal would be eaten. This, this feast of unleavened bread here. And this is a, this called, again, the, the, the one day or the whole event as it refers to, it's an old story, an old story. It's an old story that we're just not real familiar with. But to them, it was really important. By the way, it ought to be important to us. If he's the God of the Old Testament, he's the God of the New. And by the way, if he's the God of the New Testament, he can be the God of 2022. If he can take care of them, he can take care of us. <clears throat> and it matters to rehearse, to rehearse these things. Where are we going to go? It's an old story. It's that word we get Passover from. It's a new story. It's a new story. What's he doing here? The meal has ended. It's time to get up. Time to celebrate. It's time to move around. It's time to do something different. But it's a new story, and he pauses with them. They don't have any idea what he's about to do. Why? Because all those guys have done this since they were kids. You do this, you do this, you do this. When we finally get the roasted lamb, that's the deal. That's the end of it. We got this weird tasting juice that's here. 
<clears throat> it's been it's been been uh, filled up with water and it's got a little in to change the color. This represents the blood. This is this. <clears throat> and and uh, and let's find us a sweeter tune. Again, modern Jews they have they have added to this idea. And again, some of the some of the greatest. Uh, desserts out of necessity have come from it because they figured out how to do that without some leaven and all <coughs> and, and uh, spawned, spawned a whole gluten-free industry, if you would. And they, they want to do this. And he pauses and he says, and he takes some bread, and he takes a cup, takes, takes his glass, if you would, his, his goblet, and he's going to teach him something. He's going to institute something. See, the practice of the Lord's table is different than the institution of it. We usually talk about the one instead of the other. I want to focus on that. He's going to change it. He's going to change, he's going to change it in three ways here. He's going to change it in three ways. Number one, he's going to stop talking about the Passover lamb, and he's going to start talking about the precious lamb. He's going to talk, start about the precious lamb. <clears throat> the Passover lambs were many, multitudinous. Whole industries grew up just to raise and have enough lambs so that they could, they could butcher them because everybody's doing this at the same time of the year. The priests were excellent at this. And the roasting and the smells and the festivity and the solemnity and the passing generationally. And dad sitting there holding court and making sure that, that everybody knew that God took care of their forefathers coming out of Egypt. Wait for it. But every year is the same deal. Because a lamb can't, an animal can't take away your sin. The juice in that cup and the little piece of dried up bread can no more save you from your sin and the wrath to come than any lamb ever could, any, any pigeon ever could, any bull ever could, any cow ever could. And he reminds him of this and he's writing the new story and he says, hey, we're going to do this. I, I want to get you, I want to help you out here. Again, if you're, if you're new to church or not, not been around, and you hear, you hear again all the butcher songs and all the other things, you think, man, what kind of place is this? What kind of place is this? It's a, it's a Bible kind of place because God used these object lessons to see and to help us understand that these things will not work, but there is one coming who will perfectly fulfill the law of God, who will completely suffer for your and my sins, who when he sheds his life's blood, he's not going to stay dead, but he's going to rise again from the dead. And so there's a difference here from the Passover lambs, the Paschal lambs, to the precious lamb of God. There's a second thing. He's going to change the blood of the animals, and he's going, to, he's going to begin to point to the blood of the precious Lamb of God. The precious Lamb of God. He said, well, preacher, if all this is so important, let me, let me stop you right, just for a second. And nothing, nothing magical about this. The guy's putting the spikes in his hand, the arterial spray. That didn't save him from his sins. We're, we're not just talking about... We're not just talking about his, 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 his flesh and his fingernails and his feet. We're not just doing that. And, and I, know, I know there are groups out there, some seem like you listen to them, they go, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with the New Testament. He says it's the precious blood of the Lamb. It's important because He bled and died for you and for me. And it matters that He gave His life's blood for us. We use that expression, by the way, in 2022. We say blood, sweat, and tears. We mean somebody gave everything. And it was special and precious because it was His. And it was and it, and the saving power, again, not in the fluid, but in what He did and the fact that, that He rose again. Don't misunderstand that, but to understand that what those animals did could never satisfy the wrath of God. But Jesus could. By the way, you can spend an eternity in hell and still never satisfy the wrath of God. We have infinitely offended an infinitely holy God and it'll take an infinite amount of time to ever satisfy. And again, those are gibberish kind of words here. But we understand that this is precious. And then he turns that bread of affliction, that bread of affliction into his body broken for you. It's, just, it's funny to me. <coughs> I look back through some old notes. I look back through some new things I had. 
Is there, is there anything, everybody here under 25, is there anything more boring than listening to old people tell the same stories you've heard before? Does anything rival with that? Do you just want to punch in and go, look, look, I've heard this one. Can I just get credit? Can we do something else? Do something else. Growing up, growing up, it was, growing up, it was, please, can we go outside and play? And now it's, please, may I have my electronic device? Please don't make me hear this mess again. Please don't. And they'd figured out, they figured out that they had these bitter kind of herbs and, and maybe a little olive oil or something. And so at a certain point, when they were just kind of losing interest, they give it to the kids and kind of wake them up, kind of soury, again, called bitter herbs. And so you take those bitter herbs, a little bit of oil, and you take that unleavened bread, and you get that, and that's what you're giving to the kids, and that would perk them up a little bit, perk them up because they were going to lay some more truth on them here. <clears throat> and the unleavened bread, and all that came to represent this bread of affliction. Why? Because they couldn't put leaven in it, because they had to get it and go, because they were leaving, because God knew that Pharaoh was going to be mad, he was going to try and kill them. And so you've got all these things that are going on. And so it's no longer this. It's no longer a wake-up call. It's no longer just we're doing this to remember. Wait for it. Hmm. This is his body broken. Every how many meals I had at my grandmother's house, I, I, I remember very few. I remember some of the items. I don't think I, I remember a conversation I had with her. She passed. I was in the early 20s. My memory, her length of time she's been gone. Look right here. See, if we're real honest cross, resurrection, crucifixion, shedding of his blood, dying on the cross, all that becomes part of the background noise in our life. And we think about it about four or five weeks a year, just like we think about Christmas and the, and the virgin birth, two or three, four weeks a year. And we need help remembering. We need help appreciating. And our minds just do not want us to think about the agony and the awfulness of the cross. We struggle with that. So instead of that, just remember, he's going to give us this object lesson. He's going to give us this object lesson. He's going to change it. So, so what's the object lesson? What's the object lesson here? Let me, he said, it's my body. It's my blood, so he uses the juice in the bread here. And he changes things. If you'll stay with me just for a second or two, we're going we're gonna to wrap up. Look right here. I want to I say this emphatically. I'm trying to be descriptive because I know this is a foreign thing to us. But you understand, his death is the benefit and not, and not the bread. His death is the benefit. His, his uh, excuse me, the dying and the shedding of his blood, his suffering is the benefit, not the juice. Eating bread and drinking juice is not what gets you right with God. Somebody putting a wafer in your mouth, somebody, somebody giving you these kind of... If that was the case, then we just need to load up those t-shirt cannons, right? And just start shooting bread at everybody. Man, eat this bread. We prayed over it, right? I don't think we ought to do that. I think we ought to shoot biscuits. How many think biscuits maybe have more saving effect, right? Or some hot cornbread. You know, if we're just going to, we're going to do this. It's not the implements. It's what the implements represent. Grace is not given through that physical form. Grace is simply, excuse me, the physical form is simply the representation of what Jesus did. Don't get really excited that in a minute you get to drink a little juice and have a little wafer. Don't get really excited there. That's just the representation. That is not the benefit. The benefit comes from what he did. From what he did. By the way, and I'll stand there and I'll die on that hill. And as more and more folks continue to go, well, I got baptized, well, I got wet, or somebody sprinkled me. Again, I said, to, I said one time kind of jokingly, if that's the case, we go through the nursery at the hospital with a super soaker, right? Just, just hose off all the babies. They're good to go. I'm not being ugly. I'm not, but, you, but babies can't believe and, and physical stuff can't save me. It is what Christ did for us. His death is the benefit. It's a new object lesson. It's a new observance. This do in remembrance of me. This is the blood of the New Testament. In my, in my, this is my new covenant with you. By the way, 
To the Jews He gave the truth, and out of the one people, they were supposed to bless all nations. And the new covenant is through the one act of Christ dying and rising again. He was to, this, his, this was for all people, Jew and Gentile. He had died to save all men. The invitation is open. The new promise has been made. No more lambs need to be slain. No more bulls. None of that because the once for all sacrifice for all men has been done. There's the old story. There's the new story. And there's your story. There's your story. What God did sufficient for you, for your past, for your sin, for your mistakes, for your mess ups, for, for all the things that you feel guilty about, it's sufficient. Sufficient how? Sufficient for the wrath of God. The violence, tearing of the bread, the violence that's about to happen to the body of Christ, the violence. The wrath that needs to be satisfied. I've said it before. My kids laugh whenever I do it. If mom caught us doing something, it was death on a stick times two. Every now and then she'd blow it off, but most of the time she'd deal with it. Dad, by the time he got home from work, we'd already been executed. Judgment had come. If they were both at home at the same time, depending on what it was, my dad would utter these great words, boys will be boys, no matter who was bleeding or what was broken, unless it was his stuff. He'd say that, and we'd go scot-free. And it was great. It was beautiful. We loved it. My kids said, why do you never say that? Because it wasn't very effective. It didn't help us <laughs> very much. God never said boys will be boys. He never said, well, your sin just goes out in the ether. Somebody's going to be punished. Sin has to be paid for. And either you can pay for it or Jesus can pay for it. See, when you ask Christ to forgive you your sins, you're saying, Lord, you take my punishment. I accept, rather, what you did in taking my punishment. And when you take my punishment, then I can be right with God. And His wrath is satisfied. And the Lamb of God that's slain for your sins is sufficient to satisfy the wrath of God. Then second and third, we must remember what He's done. And that's hard, isn't it? I'm busy. Stuff to do. Things going on. Life is happening. And we buy tokens. We'll, we'll buy some jewelry. We'll buy decorations. Maybe we'll get a portrait. Maybe we'll get a devotional book. Maybe we'll, we'll get a, a cross bookmark we'll put in our Bible. And we get, need all the help we can because we struggle here. Because it's tough thinking about that we're awful, bad, terrible sinners. And it's tough thinking about what Jesus did to satisfy and to pay for our sins. It's just difficult. We need help. I need help. And then what does he say? He said, I won't do this anymore. I won't drink of this cup anymore, drink of this juice, until I come again. So every time we do this, we get look forward to the time he comes. Because there's a day coming when we'll all do this with Him. We'll sit down, what we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we'll do this together. Supper is over. Tears that hard roll. I'm giving you something new. It's my body. You have to take it. You're going to have to understand what I'm trying to teach you. This is the new signatory. It's no longer the blood of the animals. What I'm about to do, by the way, very shortly, this is what changes everything. It's not just God passing over. It's God being satisfied. It's not just millions more animals being butchered. And roasted, there's going to be a once-for-all sacrifice. It will satisfy the Father, and it will make you be able to be forgiven. And part of my family. And I want you to remember, and I want you to celebrate.